All right. Good morning, everybody, um, and afternoon for those of you who are in a different time zone from us on the West Coast. Uh, this is Una Daly, um, the Community College Consortium OER Director at the Open Ed Consortium. And welcome to our uh, May webinar. This is our fifth and final webinar for the spring season. And this is a really fun webinar because this is all about um, the members of our consortium and, and community colleges in North America and the wonderful work they're doing around OER. And we have three, uh, actually, I'm sorry, we have four uh, folks to speak with you today about um, really exciting um, OER and open textbook adoption work that they're doing um, in their districts and colleges and states. So exciting webinar today. Thank you for coming. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, we are using the uh, Blackboard Collaborate system from the California Community College system, and we thank them for that. Uh, this webinar will be recorded, and uh, we have a captioner, and we thank our captioner for that. So uh, the recording will have captions as well, and uh, it will be available within a week. Um, it's posted both on our website and also up on the Open Ed Consortium YouTube channel. So over on the left-hand side of your screen, you should see a list of participants. And uh, if you scroll down, um, you should see yourself uh, in there. And the chat window is immediately underneath. We'll be using the chat window for most of the Q&A until we get to the end of our webinar. And then we'll, we'll allow folks to use the microphone um, as well to speak with us. Um, and we welcome your questions and comments as we go along. We'll answer as many as we can, and uh, we'll, but we might save some of the um, more complicated ones for the end. All right. Uh, now I, I want to ask you to tell us where you're from. Um, and you can do this in a couple of ways. You can type in the chat window, uh, tell us what uh, College, university, or area you're from, or I see some of you folks are already jumping ahead. Thank you. You can use the toolbar, the second icon on the bottom, the one that has the little star. You can uh, you can grab one of those and uh, plop it over on um, the location that you're on on the globe. And so far, I see uh, North America. I see, oh, I see I see great. I see some folks from the northeast and the north north central area. Um, and I know that we've got somebody here from Vancouver. I saw somebody log in. But, oh, there we go. All right. So it looks like today we're primarily from North America. But uh, looks like we've got someone from Florida too. Very exciting. Um, occasionally, we do get folks from overseas uh, because, of course, we're part of the larger Open Ed Consortium. But today looks like a North American one. But once again, this is recorded, so you can share with uh, you can share with folks overseas who. Uh, might be sleeping right now. All right. Now I want to tell you a little bit about the uh, amazing experts we have this morning uh, to talk with you. And I'm going to give them a chance actually to uh, tell you a little bit about themselves uh, before we get into the main part of the webinar. So I'm going to start here with Paul Golish, who is the CIO and the Dean of Information Technology at Paradise Valley College. And Paul? You want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, good morning. Uh, along with those responsibilities, I'm also an adjunct math instructor and one of the tri chairs for our Maricopa Millions uh, OER project in the Maricopa Community Colleges. We're 10 college district. And currently I'm on sabbatical, and I will be talking about that a little bit later as well. Yes. Thank you, Paul, for joining us. And um, Paul has had, uh, I think, the privilege uh, and, pre and pleasure of having an OER sabbatical. So we're looking forward to hearing about uh, what Paul's been up to. Um, and next up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Thea Alvarado, who is a sociology faculty at College of the Canyon and also a uh, co-author of an open textbook on sociology. Hi, everyone. My name is Thea Alvarado. I'm adjunct faculty at College of the Canyons um, in sociology. And um, I work to edit and write our Introduction to Sociology textbook. Wonderful. Thank you, Thea. And uh, next, I'd like to introduce Katherine Coleman, 
who is also a sociology faculty at College of the Canyons and is also one of the co-authors of the Introduction to Sociology textbook. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Katie. Katie, can you hear me? I, I can okay. hear you perfect. Thank so, you. Um, I am at College of the Canyons in sociology, using OER in my classes for about five years now. And I am currently part of a group that is trying to design and implement an OER degree pathway. Great. Um, thank you, Katie. Uh, great to have you this morning and um, excited to hear about the Z degree. Um, and last but not least, we have Todd Bigby from uh, the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities. Todd is the Assistant Director of Academic Technology. And we're really thrilled to hear about all the great work that's been going on in Minnesota. Hi, everyone. Yes, it's Todd Digby. I'm Assistant Director of Academic Technology here at our Minnesota State Colleges and Universities. Um, I oversee um, areas in the learning technologies like our learning management system, library systems, and other academic technologies. But in that mix, I also have been our lead from uh, the statewide system on textbook affordability. And in recent years, it has uh, uh, evolved into the OER work. So welcome, everyone. Great. Great. Thank you, Thank you Todd. Um, I think Todd is the first uh, person from Minsky to present with us. We had David Ernst present with us last year on the Open Textbook Library. But it's great to hear what the colleges are, are up to. All right. So um, our agenda is primarily I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview on CCC OER for those of you who might be new or you might have forgotten. <laughs> about CCC OER. And then we're going to get right to the heart of um, this presentation, which is hearing all about these uh, great projects at our colleges. And at the end, we will have time for Q&A. All right. So the Community College Consortium for OER is coming up on its eighth anniversary of being founded. And um, our mission really remains primarily the same as when we were founded. Um, we are a voice for the community colleges uh, within the open education uh, space. And um, we are all about expanding access to high quality open materials for both faculty and students. Um, and um, our webinar series is part of the faculty development that we support uh, in helping faculty and um, administrators and other staff uh, be uh, stay up to date on um, what's happening in the field and to find out about new wonderful resources that are out there. And at the heart of it all, it's about improving student success, helping students to complete uh, their degrees in a timely fashion and without um, extra debt. And um, I'm happy to say that uh, we are growing. Uh, we are at uh, um, over 250 colleges in 21 states and provinces. I think I mentioned this last uh, last month, but uh, still exciting that we have uh, new college members in Massachusetts, Texas, and Georgia. And so we're we're slowly uh, moving in towards the center um, states as well. And um, if you haven't joined us, we'd we'd love to talk with you about uh, about becoming a member. All right. So. This morning, um, we are going to be talking about uh, the growth of OER colleges, I mean, sorry, of OER projects at colleges. Um, and so by OER, I mean um, creating awareness around open textbooks and open educational resources and um, promoting the adoption of, of those resources, uh, both to support faculty choice and innovation and to help students uh, with affordability. And, um, and learning as well. And I, I think you know the community colleges um, have been working in the OER space yeah, for about eight years now um, as a consortium. And it, it aligns very well with our open access mission of accepting the top 100% of students. And so we are really about affordability and access. The last few years um, have seen a great uh, growth in awareness of OER. Uh, there's been federal and state grants and various legislation that has supported this and has started to make this conversation far easier. Um, and so faculty are much more 
I would say faculty are more aware. Administrators at colleges are becoming very aware of open education and the potential for um, benefit through it. Um, and another thing that I, I'd like to point out about community colleges is that uh, we very much um, have a focus on teaching and student learning. Um, and um, adoption of OER has been far greater at community colleges than other uh, four-year colleges and universities where they've, they've uh, participated more in creating OER. And there's nothing the matter with creating OER, but sometimes it can be far more cost efficient to adopt and adapt OER. And community colleges have really been leaders in doing that. So without further ado, I'm going to let you hear from the experts this morning. And we're going to let Paul start um, this morning. Okay, thanks, Una. Um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I am one of the tri chairs of the Maricopa Millions Project. And uh, one of our goals, or our biggest goal, I guess, was to try and save students $5 million over five years. So we've been tracking that on our website. And our website is maricopa.edu slash OER. And we're up to, after about two years on the project, $3.5 million, as you can see on the right. Then we track each uh, semester, at least fall and spring. And we're hitting, the uh, last couple of semesters, right about a $1 million a semester. So we're pretty excited about that. Well, the way we calculate that, by the way, is we some pretty conservative numbers. Uh, we use about $100 per textbook and about 20 students per class. Um, so we calculate it that way. Um, so each semester, uh, we have a call for proposals. We call it each phase in which we send out a call for courses to be developed. And we fund those one time for the district. So there's only one English 101 that's funded for the district. And the first couple of phases there, that box didn't quite go down low well enough, but uh, the first four courses uh, finished their pilots. And we're having some. Uh, peers review them this summer, and then we will scale up the adoption on those courses. And then as you can see, phase three and phase four, the last couple of semesters, they're in development and will be piloted in the next academic year. Um, and we just awarded those phase four ones down there. Again, most of this uh, information is on our website. Uh, one of our biggest uh, success stories, I think, is the use of MyOpenMath, uh, although we call it MathAS, our own instance uh, of a math program. Uh, MyOpenMath, or it's also known as WAMAP and some other uh, names, has, was created by David Lippman several years ago, a math professor in the state of Washington, and was enhanced by 4,000 some videos by James Souza from Phoenix College. And then uh, our colleagues over at Scottsdale Community College really went all in on this and took it to another level by adding all sorts of materials to it. And their entire department pretty much has gone OER. And so they've really been a, a great leader on that. So we uh, continue to use that and had a big conference a few weeks ago at my college, Paradise Valley, in which we invited all the math faculty in the district uh, that were interested in OER to take a look and do a little show and tell. And that was quite successful last month. Uh, we're at about 184 sections per semester that are using just the math, the my open math. And that goes from arithmetic all the way through calculus. We're pretty happy with that, but we would like to increase the adoption of uh, my open math with the, both within the district and throughout the country. And even though that looks like a lot of sections, what we discovered is that's really only about 13% of the math sections that we offer in our district. Again, we're 10 community colleges. So one of the things that we're doing, and this kind of leads into my sabbatical work, is we are working on redesigning. We're working closely with David Lipman and uh, Lumen Learning, who is who I have had the uh, pleasure of working with over the last few months and the next couple months as my part of my sabbatical, is to help redesign my open math and update the look of it. So this is what it currently looks like. And here's a little sneak peek at what we think it's going to look like uh, when we get done with the redesign. And we hope to um, 
it'll probably be a year before it's fully rolled out, but uh, we will be doing some piloting probably in the spring. Uh, but we're gonna working on that. And we, there's probably a thousand faculty throughout the country and actually I guess we've got some users in Germany that are currently using MyOpenMath. Uh, back to the Maricopa Millions project, one of the things we also have done is try to help students find the courses and I think some of the other uh, colleges around the district are doing something similar. So this is how our students look up courses in the course catalog. Uh, we call it Find a Class. And it's at classes.sis.maricopa.edu. And what they can do is a couple of things. On the left side, if they scroll down, they can choose a filter that says no cost or low cost materials, and they check that. And then it will bring up all the courses that we offer at any of our 10 colleges that uh, are available with the materials being less than $40. In most cases, that's OER. In some cases, it's just very inexpensive textbooks. Another thing they can do is just type in OER in the keyword search and it brings up the same results. So that's been working fairly well. Um, sometimes it's hard to get the, the folks to remember to enter in the code, um, but we're, we're making our, uh, some progress in that area. So another part of my sabbatical along with working on the Myopa Math redesign has been to visit some other colleges and see what they're doing with their OER projects and to uh, perhaps help with uh, some adoption at those places. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting with some folks in Oregon uh, last month and uh, what I learned about what they're doing is they're really doing some great stuff in Oregon and, and sometimes although we hear about it um, by doing some reading and reading on listservs, et cetera, until you actually go out and meet with the folks, maybe you don't learn exactly what, what they're doing. So I got to attend a regional conference last month in Eugene and found out that they're doing all sorts of great stuff there. Uh, they have uh, they've had several regional conferences throughout the uh, state in which they have brought in speakers from around the country to talk to folks and they also had, at the conference I was at at least, they had a student panel, which was great. I highly recommend that, bringing in students to talk about the impact that OER has had for them. Uh, so each of the, the students spoke about how meaningful it was for them. Also, at Lane Community College, uh, at least one student put together this manifesto uh, and it makes a nice poster and uh, has also shared it so that, uh, as you can see there, down in the corner, there's a little CC BY license so people can modify that and use that if they'd like. Uh, the faculty have been using this um, website, openoregon.org, which has been very helpful and they've had a call for proposals for grants that they'll be working on this summer. And even the uh, legislators are getting in on the act with House Bill 2871. So a lot of great stuff going on in Oregon that, that I've learned about um, more in depth by, by visiting there. So I guess my point here is if you can get out and see what other folks are doing, um, definitely be reading about it, listening to webinars like this. But if you get an opportunity to visit, uh, it's, it's a great way to connect with other folks and, and learn what they're doing. Uh, again, with my sabbatical, I'm working closely with the folks at Lumen Learning. And what we're discovering is a, a lot of times you get that initial wave of people that do development and jump right into uh, open educational resources or, what, or whatever they uh, are interested in, but then it's hard to get the next group. So Lumen does a really nice job of supporting those folks and taking the next steps. And they also have a number of courses available on, on their website that can be uh, integrated into any learning management system with their Candela system, so it's really a, a nice uh, way to go there. Another thing that, that Lumen has provided is uh, this impact at lumenlearning.com where you can go and you can use the sliders on the left to adjust uh, different variables such as textbook costs, enrollment, tuition costs, and see what the impact is of the um, of using open educational resources. So I encourage you to take a look at that. And I think I'm just about out of time. So I wanted to uh, let you know that, oh, I also added something here. My, my daughter texted me, uh, actually, uh, that she 
did not buy a $230 textbook. So um, sometimes these textbook costs are, are way out of, of whack and, uh, and that's her opinion about it. Anyway, if you've got some questions, go ahead and throw them in the uh, chat box or take a look at our, our website or hit us up on Twitter. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, and um, we are going to hold the questions to the end, but I'll just give you an FYI, Paul, that um, someone asked about the OER rubric that uh, you guys developed in Maricopa. So if you have a link for that, it um, would be great to get that in the chat window. And we'll come back to that at uh, the end of the, of the presentation. So next, um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Pia Alvarado and Katherine Coleman, uh, both faculty, sociology faculty at College of the Canyon, and also co-authors of the introductory Introduction to Sociology textbook uh, that has been used over the last five years at College of the Canyons and has literally saved um, students millions of dollars there. Um, Katie or Thea, uh, please go ahead. Okay, so we are talking about the Introduction to Sociology open source textbook today, although we're also going to mention a couple of other efforts that are going on here at COC currently. The history of our Intro to Sociology, it was, that textbook was originally sent to us by Paul Hammond and Ron Cheney of Utah Valley University as more of sort of a collection of pretty thorough lecture notes. And it went underwent two rounds of editing and revision by two sociology faculty members in 2010. And by 2012, two more faculty members joined and made editorial contributions. And uh, we were really able to focus on our areas of expertise within each chapter between the four of us. Then we had such great success with the intro textbook, we decided to tackle a marriage and family text. And that was edited and launched with it by the four faculty members from the previous. Uh, the texts are updated and edited for content and relevant examples and pictures are added each academic year. We usually try to get this done over our summer session to have it updated by fall. So the logistics of launching this OER text in these classes, we Revisions are posted on our department website within our learning management system, which at COC is Blackboard currently. We created a department page on Blackboard, so our faculty are able to log in and take the entire textbook or take one chapter at a time or whatever it is that they want to use in their courses. They're also able to make editorial changes for their classes. Over 4,000 students have used the open source text for the intro book alone. And it's provided for students on COC's LMS also, but they are able to access the PDF version. We can also access this book, anybody can, on collegeopentextbook.org. So currently at, at College of the Canyons, we have three courses using OER materials in lieu of for-profit text. The first is Introduction to Sociology, then our course here is called Intimate Relationships, Marriage and Family. And we have most recently adopted OER in our Sociology of Aging course. Now, I, while the Marriage and Family and Introduction course have more traditional looking OER textbooks, in our Sociology of Aging course, because there wasn't necessarily a readily available sociology of aging textbook as opposed to something like a gerontology textbook, what we did was we were able to take articles and textbook chapters and create PowerPoints from OpenStax, Merlot, Sophia, and College Open Textbook. Uh, these are some of the topics covered in that class. So we can see, for example, the social theories of aging. I was able to borrow from one chapter from a an intro book, and same thing with family and aging, I was able to borrow from another intro book, Love, Intimacy, and Sexuality in Old Age, I took a chapter from a human sexuality book, and Living Arrangements and Social Roles, I was able to pull the National Housing Conference report from 2014, 
and create an assignment out of that to, to meet those needs so students can participate that way. <coughs> uh, so far we have, right currently we have 33 sociology faculty at COC and almost half of us are using OER in our classes. We have across the three courses 25 sections total with about 30 to 35 students in each course. And assuming a new for-profit text would be about $100, students have saved $75,000 this semester alone in these courses. Um, it's interesting, I actually just looked up the, the textbook I used to use about five years ago, and it's now currently listed at about $145. And this semester we were able to launch a campus-wide survey to all part-time and full-time faculty, asking them about OER, and 17% of COC faculty responded they are currently using OER materials in their courses. It doesn't necessarily mean in lieu of a textbook, or a for-profit textbook, I should say, but they at least 17% are using some kind of OER material. But 87% said that using OER, it, they are either satisfied or extremely satisfied with the content. And 88% of faculty responded that while they're not using, currently using OER, they are very interested in learning more about it. So we have started talking about and um, designing and hopefully implementing even more professional development opportunities across the campus in the, in the coming months to meet that need. So one of the great things about our Introduction to Sociology textbook is that you can use the chapters in any order. They're not ordered chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. And so for an instructor, they can move around from topic to topic according to the threads that they are linking within their own classes. We also have a glossary that we update fairly regularly and a chapter just on getting through school with community college students. So for the advantages and the potential disadvantages for students, the greatest advantage, of course, is that it's free. And this is a huge issue when dealing with student equity because you don't want to disadvantage a student who can't afford a $200 textbook. I'm looking for a new edition at another college where we use a standard hard copy textbook, and it's $250. And I can imagine that would be quite prohibitive to some of my students at the community college level. Our textbook is accessible to everyone from the first day of class because it lives in our LMS course shell. So there's no wait for students to get textbooks. They don't have to wait in line that first week in the bookstore. Everyone is ready to go from the very first day. The students can save, print, email, and share the files without restrictions. And one of the great things at College of the Canyons is that our students are able to print up to 15 pages for free in our ASD or Associated Student Government Lab um, as part of their student fees. And a chapter in our textbook is roughly 15 pages. So they can go and print the chapter and bring it to class and continue to do that as the semester goes on. There are no heavy textbooks for students to have to carry around or to be forgotten. And they can bring it chapter by chapter to class as we're covering the material. Also, the text can be accessed by most mobile devices. The students have access to the text all the time. And we know most of our students have smartphones. So as long as they're able to pull up um, a PDF file, they can open up our textbook. One of the potential disadvantages to students is that if they have to print it out if they want a paper copy. One way around that is to offer a printed copy through your bookstore. And what we figured at College of the Canyons was that the bookstore could mark up the um, OER text as much as they do a for-profit text, and it would still cost about $18 to print for our students. To next, some of the potential advantages and disadvantages for professors and faculty in using the textbook. Um, one of the advantages is that no orders have to go through the bookstore, and especially for adjunct faculty teaching on multiple campuses, um, keeping track of deadlines for bookstores and who to contact um, can be a bit of a task. Um, professors are able to adapt the textbook to lecture, not the way around. And it really takes the pressure off of a faculty member because it lets you allow the discussions in class to go wherever they need to go. So you can follow student learning and you don't have to worry about making sure that you cover the material in that chapter. 
because you know that the chapter and the lecture and discussions all go hand in hand, and so students can go home and read the material, and you don't have to worry about food feeding them all that material during class. Um, our example, the photos and our statistics are always current. So if I, uh, for example, were to um, find a great statistic from the U.S. Census Bureau that was relevant to one of our chapters, I could go and I could edit it and I could get it to students right away. And so I don't have to worry about this outdated text that was published five, ten years ago. Um, I was at Lakeshore Learning Center a few semesters ago and they had these prepackaged family toys for these different racial and ethnic groups. So I took a picture with my cell phone and I put into our OER text and so students get that as a relevant example. I know that in some departments, uh, the faculty are concerned about standardization. Uh, they want all faculty to use the same textbook and they want all the materials to be the same. Um, these textbooks that we're working with, the, standardized, the content is standardized to begin. Um, and so if you don't do any edits, then everyone has the same material. Um, and also faculty become intimately familiar with the content. So no matter how many times you read a textbook published by a big publishing company, until you edit it, you really aren't as familiar with it as you become with the OER material. The chapters can be used in any order according to um, what you cover in your schedule. And just sort of anecdotally, we found that uh, student success, retention, and participation go up. So we did a, a sort of quasi-experiment in our department where we went from a for-profit textbook to OER material um, without changing anything else in the course. And we found that student success actually went up about 20%. So some of the potential disadvantages, um, there is an initial time investment um, if you want to edit the textbook before you get it to your students. And also we would recommend some regular revision cycles to make sure that the material is still relevant. Um, depending on what your campus is or what organizations you're associated with, you might be able to apply for grant funding for that time. Uh, you might also be able to get release time for your college, like a sabbatical. It's definitely feasible for one faculty member to do editing over the course of the semester or even during a winter or summer break. Um, or they could just adopt the resources as they are. I know you know editing is required. Um, for us in our department, we use this as an opportunity to, for faculty to get together to work on our, our common goal of getting this OER textbook out to our students. And so we each sort of grabbed a chapter according to what our areas of specialization are and had some really excellent and fruitful discussions about the learning and content as a result. Um, another potential disadvantage is that the chapters can be edited by the individual instructors, leading to a loss of standardization. Um, but I actually consider that to be a great thing that I could go and edit the textbook because I can find those local examples that are relevant to my students. So for example, at College of the Canyons, we're located in Santa Clarita um, near Valencia, California. And so quite a few of our students know Six Flags Magic Mountain because it's right down the street. And so I can take that and use it as an example in my chapter on culture. And so students are able to get it because it's relevant to them right away. And then the last potential disadvantage is the potential loss of big publisher resources. Again, I don't see this as too much of a disadvantage. As a faculty member, you still have access to those resources like PowerPoints and test banks. Um, but what I was finding was that I had to do so many revisions to those materials to make them relevant and current that um, the OER really takes away some of those frustrations. And, um, when I was looking at sort of new textbooks to adopt in my classes, again, the, the um, for-profit textbook, what I found was that they had student learning outcomes for each of the chapters. But those weren't the student learning outcomes that I had for my classes and that we had at our college. So OER gives you the ability to adapt the course materials and the course out to your course outline and your student learning outcomes, not the other way around. All right. Um, thank you, uh, Thea and Katie. Are, are you finished with your presentation? Yes. Okay. And um, I, I did add this slide here because um, Anne Marenko, who is the department chair of, of sociology at College of the Canyons, and she's also a co-author along with uh, Thea and Katie of the Introduction to Sociology textbook, 
Um, she started this about five years ago. I, I, actually, I guess it's, yeah, a little over five years ago at College of the Canyons. And uh, this year, she was awarded the Open Education Excellence Award uh, for Educators of 2015. And um, so we just wanted to mention Ann Marenko, um, who chairs that department. All right. Um, Thea and um, Katie are very busy faculty members, and they have to leave um, actually in a few moments, in about five or ten minutes. And so we wanted to um, give them a chance to um, answer some of your questions before we go on to Todd's presentation. So I think we can take about five minutes here um, if we have questions. And um, I, I noticed that uh, there was a question uh, earlier uh, from Jim Julius, and he, he asked, um, uh, about do you have the percentage of teachers that use OER in lieu of textbooks at this point? Uh, we're currently working on that. Actually, as we speak, I sent out about, I would guess, 65 emails yesterday trying to, to determine whether or not they were using completely in lieu of a textbook or if they were purchasing, requiring students to purchase anything that just wasn't uh, named by our bookstore, but right now we are guessing it's at okay. As we think, at about 15% of faculty are using completely OER led courses. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, well, keep us you know keep us updated as you get those numbers because we'd love to share that. Um, I think that that's probably a pretty high percentage for um, for a college. So exciting. Um, one other thing that came up um, was. Um, the link to um, the um, open textbook for um, introduction to sociology. The College Open Textbook has a print copy that you can order, um, but I know that at one point there was um, a link to the textbook um, from the website um, at your college. And, and I don't know. This might be a question. I, I know that you're. Um, your dean of distance education, <laughs> and of course the president of CCCOER is online. James, do you know uh, where there might be a link to the materials? I don't know. James may have had to leave. Uh, oh, he's looking for it. If we don't find it, um, we can um, we can send that out when we send the link to folks um, for the archive recording. And this is the uh, I, my email address is um, showing right now. So if anyone would like to have a copy of the textbook, just go ahead and email me. We have it available in two different forms. We have it in PDF, chapter by chapter by chapter, and then we also have one large PDF file that is the entire textbook, um, where you can go from chapter to chapter. But because it's one file, you'd have to sort of skip around. For us in our department, it lives in our LMS, and so individual faculty members are able to go and grab the textbook, parts of the textbook as they need. Okay, great. Thank, thank you, Katie, for um, offering uh, people to contact you over email, and she also put uh, her copy in Smashwords if you want to take a look right away at what's available. And James, uh, who is the Dean there of um, Distance Education and Learning Resources, um, mentions that they had an OER repository at the college which they're phasing out of right now. And so that's why some of the links that used to be external are um, unavailable at the moment. Okay, we have a question here from Scott. Um, Scott is asking, what is the easiest tool for faculty to edit text in order to, uh, okay, in order to edit PDF? Um, and um, let's see, Thea and Katie are answering in the uh, chat window. Um, Thea says that they have Word files available, and Katie says um, she's able to send that in Word format. So does that answer your question, Scott? Okay, super. All right. Do we have any other questions for um, Thea or Katie at this time? As I as both of them mentioned, you can contact them over email if you do. Um, they'd be happy to answer those uh, after the fact, and we're going to let them go off and do teaching. Um, and we're going to move on to our 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 next presenter. Um, 
which is Todd Bigby, the Systems Director of Academic Technology. And um, I know Todd was telling us yesterday that um, he comes from a library background. And so um, we're very excited to have Todd uh, talk about it from, of course, you know, the perspective of getting librarians and other folks involved as you create awareness and um, among faculty and um, staff and students around OER. So Todd, please go Thank ahead. You, Anna. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. Yes, and as Anna said, I, I do come from a um, library background. I'm a librarian by an academic librarian by uh, training and experience. And actually, when I moved into the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities, it was as the uh, director of libraries. So that has uh, evolved over time, but that role actually did set me up to be um, to oversee the um, centralized system-wide uh, textbook affordability initiatives, like I said earlier, and um, that is definitely over the last few years uh, transitioned into a bit more focused effort around open education uh, resources and open textbooks. So just to tell you a little bit about our system, um, well, there's my name again. Um, we we represent um, the system office here. We have uh, 31 institutions with 54 campuses across our state. Uh, 24 of them are technical and community colleges. Um, some of them are just technical colleges. Some of them are community colleges. Some of them are combined. And we also have seven state universities. We serve approximately 430,000 students a year. Um, that uh, uh, roughly, that's about 150,000 FYE. So we're a relatively large system, and um, so over the uh, over the past few years, like I said, we've been tracking textbook affordability. We have some very strong student governance uh, groups, statewide student uh, associations, who um, are very effective in um, um, pushing for for. For their, you know, their priorities. Well, you know, obviously tuitions one, financial aid is another, but usually third on their list is textbooks and cost of textbooks. So, um, some of the recent legislation in 2013 really led to the project that we're doing now. And this was part of one of our legislative performance goals as a system was to um, lower the cost associated, um, the total cost of education or student cost with. Um, by the textbooks through the increased usage of OERs. Um, this is actually an opportunity for us to do uh, something we haven't normally done, and that is work directly with faculty. So as a pilot project over the last year, um, we um, started to look at how we could work with faculty and what were the barriers. So we looked at the research. On, like I mentioned last year, Dave Ernst was one of the presenters here. And we actually worked quite closely looking at some of the initiatives he's done and what were some of the barriers uh, or an, and, and opportunities where, where, where could we be most effective um, in our efforts. So looking at faculty awareness was a huge issue for adoption. So. Um, this is just a statistic out of a report that came out a few months ago and really shows a huge faculty awareness issue of open textbooks. And um, that big red arrow or big red bubble is not as high, is not as big for administrators. Actually, administrators know a lot more about them than faculty do, at least from this data. So we want to address that awareness. And from David Ernst, we found, you know, from his projects at the University of Minnesota, we found that you know here's the, some of the barriers that we needed to work with faculty. Where one was raising the awareness, and that was through training, then helping them find the material since they're scattered everywhere. And we have lots of projects that help this. You know, there's different projects, as all of you are aware, um, <clears throat> with these materials around. But they really want some um, place that they could go to one stop, find some materials. They also had quality concerns, so they wanted to have time to get in and either. Um, review them themselves or see that other faculty in their own disciplines have reviewed them. So they want to make sure that there's quality there. And they also wanted some support in getting it done. And so when we looked at our project, um, we decided to try something. We looked at four disciplines <coughs> in our initiative. We looked at accounting, biology, mathematics, and psychology. And we did a call for participation from faculty from both our two-year campuses, our colleges, and our state universities. What we were really hoping to do in this initial uh, project is hopefully get around 10 faculty members um, per discipline. And the reason these disciplines were chosen was because of the nature of our system. These tended to be the courses taught at all of our campuses. Um, they tended to be high enrollment classes. 
and they tended to be ones that had um, relatively high textbook costs. So it's sort of the low-hanging fruit here. And when we did this, we actually had quite good response. Um, here's the number of faculty that actually signed up. And really, you know, it's, and this is across our different campuses. Um, they're very, we have very independent campuses as well. So we have good participation here. We actually had really good in biology and mathematics. And um, instead of just choosing 10 from each, we let everyone who wanted to participate. And so what we did with the groups um, is we worked with actually the University of Minnesota in conjunction with them and said, why do we want to duplicate something else in Minnesota? So we worked with the Open Tech Textbook Network, Open Textbook Library at the University of Minnesota, and the URL is at the bottom of this slide. Um, I think there's a couple more universities in, in this group so far, I think, uh, that they've added since then, so you'll see a few more colleges. But what we did was we worked with them on training and then actually uh, had worked with them for their peer review process. So what we did was we, for all these faculty to participate, um, there, might, there was a reason they came too, and part of the reason was we were going to give them a stipend for this or, a, in, in a, depending on our union, a duty day. So we actually gave approximately $500 for them to go through the training and them to actually conduct a review on a, on a textbook. Um, there was no pressure to adopt one, but we really did want to aware the, raise awareness and, among faculty um, at our different campuses. So this was one way to do it was to incentivize them, recognize them for their time commitment um, in doing it. So working with uh, David Ernst and the University of Minnesota, um, he came in, he did some training on Creative Commons and the issues, raised some awareness about why, why are textbook costs so high and how is this different from before, for, you know, 20 years ago for students and why can open textbooks be one of the possibilities there. So after the review process, um, it went quite good. We had faculty participation in it and the reviews just came in at the end of March. Now there are, our set of reviews are actually not on that open textbook library yet. He's still getting them in there. But we're starting to get the data back um, from faculty right now. And out of those that went through the process, we actually had faculty starting to adopt already. So 22% had started to adopt already. We actually had 47% additionally planning on adopting. So the review and the awareness raising is paying off. 28% um, are undecided and we had very few that were not planning on adopting a textbook at this point. Uh, an, an open textbooker has only one really made decision, no, this isn't going to work. So, and I think why this is important, given even though we had uh, a number of just around 50 or so faculty going through the process, one of the parts when I actually did the call for, per, call for participation was I, I intentionally asked them to um, list the courses they were teaching, list how many students a semester they taught, and then listed how much the textbook for each course was, the new version of the textbook they were doing. And when I only took, I only actually selected one of those books, the first one they listed for each of the faculty that um, um, responded to the call for participation was when I added that total up for just one course per faculty member and the students they taught, that number was going to be over $900,000 a semester in, in costs for students and textbooks. So even if we are at a, Let's say we actually get the planning on adopting and the already adopted 22% to 47, you know, we're over, we're close to 70% adoption. Um, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars in savings, of potential savings. So that is really encouraging. Now, as we move forward with our projects uh, into the next years, you know, we really wanted to say, okay, well, listen to this, get some feedback from faculty initially that went through this. And so here are some comments from some of our faculty that went through. And um, really the big one that's coming back is from our math faculty. And it tends to be around the homework systems. Because really we did, looked at the, the open textbook library really includes really uh, an open textbook a fully formed textbook that is there. It doesn't include sort of what we understand as more um, modular OER type of components or, or homework systems. But what we definitely heard from math faculty is that they're, they, they would really like the homework system. So this is why even what Paul was saying earlier about the myopa math is really great. So, so as we move forward, we're going to need to introduce some of those other tool sets for faculty so that they can see there's a bit more of an ecosystem um, to work with rather than relying just on what the publisher homework test banks are. So that's where we're starting. We're also looking at, you know, 
putting this out to the campuses. Now, this isn't the only open textbook project within our system. This is the only system-wide one we've done, but we have had projects like at Anoka Ramsey Community College where they did a very similar process with a stipend and a project to implement open textbooks. So there has been some very some good work going on at our individual campuses. But what we're going to do centrally is just to keep the momentum going is we'll look at different possibilities like maybe um, um, identifying a sort of an open textbook champion or, or advocate on each campus. And, and now we're going to figure out who that might be. And so our librarians across our system, for instance, are, um, are all faculty members. And so they really um, relate to the teaching faculty fairly well. And you know, in that role as librarians, we even have one of our campuses where the librarian really is um, the main advocate for that. So we want to more formalize some of those roles and hopefully we can build the momentum and offer some support to our campuses. Because um, from an administration standpoint, students, it's easy. It's, it's affording the textbook. It's affording the class because the textbook costs aren't as high. But from an administration standpoint, from the data we have, students are not um, taking as many courses because of uh, the textbook costs. They're actually enrolling in courses based upon the textbook costs. So they're actually shopping around to look at courses depending upon this, this cost. And so if we can get, um, make these, the entry level and the barriers less for these courses, we will definitely help that retention, help getting the students get through faster. So there's uh, many different aspects to this that we're, that we're looking at. And so, you know, that's what, in the future years, like I said, we're really going to see what we can do more of a campus basis, um, support their efforts, and really help this campus peer review, the, the review efforts. Um, so, and we really use their metric that you can look at the rubric at the University of Minnesota's that open.umn.edu project. It's a very simple 10-point um, review rubric. And um, our faculty didn't really, uh, there wasn't any resistance in doing that. Now, we were incentivizing them, but they really did some really good reviews on the materials. And so that is, that is my presentation. I'm willing to take any questions you might have. Great. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Todd. Um, and it's really impressive um, what you've done in Minnesota in a short period of time, and with limited resources um, through uh, peer reviews. Uh, you know, stipending uh, faculty for doing peer reviews. So it's really exciting. Um, I, we're going to go right to questions in a moment, and uh, so we're going to be entertaining questions for both Paul and Todd. Um, and I did want to say that you know this is just a uh, you know, uh, just a few uh, OER projects that are happening at colleges throughout North America. And so we would love to um, have another webinar like this in the fall and share more of those stories. So please do contact me. We, you know, we want to share all of our colleges and the great work they're doing. And in fact, we're um, going to have an advisory tweet up next week, um, next Wednesday, a week from today. It'll, it'll be at noon uh, Pacific, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, I'll be online, and, and another and some other folks from the TCT OER leadership uh, team will be online. And um, just join us. Uh, you know, and we can answer any questions you might have. Uh, if you want to share stories with us, that would be great. So uh, hope to see you then. And we're going to turn this over to uh, you for questions. And we have had a lot of questions. <laughs> um, I'm going to go back to a couple that I know we had earlier, and then uh, we'll open it up more widely. Um, so Paul, there was a question earlier for you around the um, open course rubrics that Maricopa was using. And, and um, did we get that question answered? I think so. I, I put a link in the uh, chat window on all our materials that we currently have up there. It includes a rubric for evaluating the proposal. We're still finalizing the rubric for the peer review, so that I should have available in the next few weeks. If somebody wants to email me directly, I can get that to them once we have that available in a couple weeks. Great, great. Thank you, Paul. Because I know that that's been something that you guys have been spending this entire year focusing on. So it would be great for everyone to benefit from uh, the work you guys have done. Well, no, I just, uh, so I just noticed um, my email address is an old one. It may or may not still forward to me. So I'll put my new one in the chat window. Oh, OK. Apologies, Paul. <laughs> 
Um, and okay, thank you, Quill. She said that one. Was, she felt like it was answered. Okay, and um, we had some questions about open pedagogy as well, uh, or I shouldn't say questions, some comments. So uh, there was a great comment in there about you know we quibble about how much money students are saving, um, you know, because. There's, students have so many ways of getting textbooks. Um, it's not simply walking into the bookstore. And then there was a great discussion online about all the other benefits. Mm -hmm. And one thing that came up was around the open pedagogy idea and how much students can benefit from that as well, um, how it really gives them control of their learning. We had a wonderful webinar on this back in November with Christy Fierro, who I believe is online, um, and also with uh, um, Brent Riffle. Uh, both um, are faculty members at community colleges that have adopted OER and have really engaged their students in producing um, open educational resources as well and incorporate uh, those student products into their course um, over time to enrich the materials. Um, so I will try to get a link to that to folks. Um, and then I want to just uh, open this up for other questions. I may have missed some. So you can grab the mic. Um, or you can type directly. Um, and thank you, Mary Burgess, for putting some more open pedagogy resources in uh, in the chat window there. Um, so do please feel free to grab the talk uh, button up top. Uh, that will let you uh, speak out. And you, um, we've got Paul and Todd still here. We're waiting for uh, questions to come in. Um, okay, Paul, uh, Paul had a comment here. We need to remember that students can retain OER materials as long as the instructor allows, and, and that's a really good point about digital e-textbooks versus open textbooks. Um, and thanks, Barry, for sharing with us that they've been doing work at BC Campus. So BC Campus is also a member of the Open Education Consortium, and Mary is, is on our board. And they've done just amazing uh, work up there at BC campus at their open textbook site. And they'll be presenting at the Open Textbook Summit at the end of the month. Thanks, Mary. And if you want to put a link into that, uh, for those of you who uh, can fit in a trip to Vancouver at the end of May, um, it, it, it's, it's a wonderful event every year up there. And you get to talk with folks who are, are really involved um, in open textbook adoption. All right. And thank you, Jim, for your comment. Um, all right, and there's the Open Textbook Summit. So uh, I want to give um, Paul and Todd um, a chance for any closing comments. Um, Paul, would you like to make any closing comments before we um, before we sign off? Sure, maybe just uh, one. And I think I was either Katie or Thea also echoed uh, the thoughts about if you have an opportunity to. Um, put in a proposal for uh, either sabbatical or, or a summer project related to OER. I encourage you to get creative in your colleges and districts. Um, it's a hot time right now to be um, proposing these types of things. And, and often the administration will be very willing to, to listen to these ideas. And it's a great way to really focus on something and, and hopefully make an impact. Great. Thank you for that, Paul. And Todd, uh, any closing comments? I, I think just one. The one thing I, I didn't mention was the is really getting um, when training faculty is really doing some really good groundwork around open licenses and the Creative Commons efforts because I think that that's where um, we I've had the most follow up because there's a lot of uncertainty, especially when we put push copyright and making sure people are following copyright, but is that uneasiness about just taking something and using it without permission and really doing some uh, training on the copyright issues and how Creative Commons works with that. Um, the one thing we did do with our with our faculty and reviews was we actually made a point of saying any review you do is actually going to get a Creative Commons license. So it might not just be housed at the University of Minnesota's Open Textbook Library. Maybe the, um, the UBC wants to take and use those reviews and put them in their system as well. So we, so we did some training and said this is how, how you could fit in, so we made it real for them. 
Great, great. And obviously, yeah, OER is a great opportunity to um, go over that with faculty and the freedom that a Creative Commons license provides you over copyright and fair use. So great point. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and um, we've had some great discussion in the chat window. I'm going to direct you to the chat window since we're finishing up here. But from Quill and um, and Mary and Christy about um, the open pedagogy is also very engaging for faculty and really um, helps faculty to be effective. And <laughs> I may not have captured um, all of the wonderful comments, so please do check those out. Um, at this point, we're at the top of the hour. I don't see any um, questions. I see mostly comments. So I'm going to stop the recorder and I'm going to thank once again our wonderful speakers and thank you all for coming uh, this morning. And we hope to see you uh, next week if you're available for our tweet up. Um, and uh, if not, we'll definitely see you in the fall with our with our fall webinars in September. So thanks again.